Commissioner of Education. We have Caleb uh, Lovely, he's the Dean of Students for Charter Schools USA, Dr. Eddie Ruiz, who's the Florida State Superintendent for Charter, School, uh, Charter Schools USA, Representative Jennifer Kennedy, uh, Michelle Salzman, Senator Doug Broxson, uh, Representative Alex Andrade, uh, Sarah Peacock, uh, mother of three uh, from here in Escambia County, and we'll be hearing from some of these folks about uh, what's happened uh, right here, because I think we are uh, highlighting today the legislature has passed, they haven't sent to me yet, uh, but when they do send it to me, we will be signing House Bill 1285. Uh, and so this is a really, really comprehensive educate, piece of education legislation. Uh, we're going to highlight a handful of the items today. Uh, then when we get the bill, we'll talk about some of the other things in it. But it, there's really a lot. Uh, and of course, um, these are going to be going to be good things that are in that. But we're building on a record of success in the state of Florida. Uh, after all, uh, we've been rated number one in education by U.S. News and World Report. We're number one for parental involvement in education in all of America. Uh, we're number one for education choice and education freedom in all of America. If you look the last year, we have the NAEP results. Uh, we were third and fourth, respectively, in fourth grade reading and fourth grade math, and, and that was not true, say, 25 years ago in this state. So we continue to do more and more. And oh, by the way, throughout all of this, uh, every single year uh, I've been governor, we've provided money for increase in teacher salaries. Uh, we've provided more money for school districts while we've also bolstered choice programs to where now we have more students participating in choice programs than any other state in the country, bar none. And, and that's a great testament to the leadership in Florida, particularly the legislators who've put a lot of these policies into place. So, so we're happy about that. Uh, so we're here today to be able to highlight this bill and we'll sign it hopefully soon when we get it from the legislature. But one of the things that this does is it addresses, and that's why we're here uh, at Warrington Prep, because it's uh, the turnaround school program that the state of Florida has. And I think most people know if you receive um, two straight Ds or F uh, on your school grade, then you are put into something called a turnaround status. And that is something that uh, means that the school district has uh, two years to implement a plan for improvement. Now, uh, that did not work here in Escambia County with this school when this has happened, and this has happened over a number of, of years. Um, and so last year, Warrington Middle School ended up becoming Warrington Preparatory Academy and opened its doors as a charter school uh, run by Charter Schools USA. And the issue why we're focusing here, first you're going to hear about what that has meant for the students here, and I think people are going to say it's been largely a positive thing that's happened, uh, but this is not something that, that happened easily. There was a lot of uh, gnashing of teeth. There was a lot of dragging the feet. Uh, when you have these schools that are in turnaround status, a district has options in terms of how to remediate one of which is so you can bring in an outside operator, you can convert it to a charter school, or you can just close the school uh, and, and try something uh, in other parts of your, your jurisdiction. Uh, here, they had tried some stuff locally. It didn't work. So then they said, we're going to do the charter, but it took forever to be able to do uh, the charter contract. And so the Department of Education and the state board uh, both got, got to go in and say, okay, listen, the statute says that you have to choose a path forward. You have to execute that path forward. Uh, and if you don't do it soon, then we're going to withhold your salaries um, for, for the school board. Uh, well, they changed their tune very quickly then, and they got in and did a, uh, did a contract with Charter Schools USA to bring us to where we are today. But that's not what we want to be happening where this stuff takes forever today. I mean, if you have a school that's getting F grades, uh, we need to remediate very quickly. Uh, if you drag your feet for three or four years, those are three or four years of students that are not getting the type of education that they should be getting here in the state of Florida. So this bill is really going to add some oomph to our tur turnaround school status uh, in terms of uh, the charter school component of that. So there's a couple things. One is, I think most importantly, 
districts are going to have to act promptly uh, to do this. And once you're in turnaround status, if you choose that charter school route, you got to enter into a contract and you got to move forward so that we can get a change uh, for the better. So that's going to be really, really important. So what happened here in terms of the length of time is not something that's going to happen going forward. The other thing is, is when a school is converted into a charter, uh, the charter school, now normally charter school, it's, it is a public school, not controlled by the school district. You got to take all comers, um, similar to like a public school would do, but ne not necessarily limited to geography, uh, like the traditional public school model would be. Uh, but this one will show preference uh, for the previous school zone that serves that grade level. So if you did have students here uh, prior to the transition, when it goes to charter, we want to make sure the kids that were not being served well are first in line to be able to have a step up. And I think that that makes a lot of sense for how the legislature structured this. Uh, also, uh, when you're in turnaround status and you go the charter route, charter school is not going to be charged rent or an administrative fee. Uh, we want to make sure that we're easing the burdens uh, so that we can focus solely on turning around a poor performing school. And this piece of legislation does that. So we are really beefing up our turnaround school status. This, even though it took a long time, I think this school year is testament that there's been a lot of improvements as a result of what's happened. And you'll hear from some of the people that can talk about some of the things that have been done. But if you know something's not working, we have responsibility to act and act quickly. Uh, we shouldn't be dragging our feet. This shouldn't be taking years and years. Uh, you act and you remediate. And that's what this bill's doing. The other thing this bill does that I think is, is relevant, particularly uh, in, in this part of the state, is uh, we signed parental rights in education. We signed a parent's bill of rights in the state of Florida. We also signed bills to give parents visibility on the curriculum that is being used in their kids' schools. And unfortunately, there have been things that are clearly inappropriate for young kids that have been jammed into the curriculum. You will literally have a parent that will be uh, dissatisfied with one of the books and they will go to a school board, this happens all around the country, and they'll start reading from it or they'll start showing these graphic imagery and the school board members, oh, you can't do that here. It's, it, that's, that's inappropriate to be doing in a public forum. Well, if it's inappropriate to be doing at a school board meeting, how is it okay to be done in sixth grade? I mean, give me a break. So parents have done this, and it's important that we give parents the wherewithal uh, to make sure that what is being done in our schools is both age and developmentally appropriate. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that. Uh, you should not be having... Uh, books in these schools, particularly in, in younger grades, uh, that are sexually explicit, that are promoting ideology like gender ideology. We don't believe you teach a kindergartner that they can change their gender. That's just not appropriate. That's not what parents want to be taught in our schools. So, so that's where, and here's the thing. When you're doing, trying to shoehorn all this nonsense in, then why aren't you focusing on the things that really matter for the schools and for education? I want kids to be reading and writing. I want them to be able to add, subtract, do all the important pillars of education. And when you're getting involved in these other tangents, you by definition are not doing what you need to do in those other areas. So, so that's important that the parents have a seat at the table. It's important that they're able uh, to lodge objections when you see some of this stuff uh, filtering in. And it is done intentionally, and it is part of an agenda, and that's wrong. I mean, schools are there to serve the community. Schools are not there uh, for you to try to go on some ideological joyride at the expense of our kids. So we want to have that. We think that's important. At the same time, uh, the idea that, that someone can use the parents' rights and the curriculum transparency to start objecting to every single book to try to make a mockery of this is wrong. And you've had examples where books were so put under review that are just normal books that have been in education for many, many years. You had a situation down in another part of the state of Florida where you had some teacher was being very passive aggressive, was trying to say, oh, parents rights bill, I, I can't have any books in school, covering up all the books. That, that's performative. 
That's political. You're trying to be an activist when you should be trying to be an educator. So this bill addresses that. Um, it ensures that we prioritize parents with children in the school district. Uh, but what we're saying is, look, if you don't have kids in the district, it's not that you, I mean, you're a taxpayer, if you're a citizen, I mean, you have an interest in there. But clearly the parents, I think, have the, the most significant interest. Uh, so if you're a parent in the, in, with kids in the schools, then, you know, you can do similar to what's been under the legislation. You know, if you see something that's age or developmentally inappropriate, you can raise an objection to that. Uh, if you don't have kids in the school district, uh, you still are a citizen. You still can be interested in education, uh, but you're going to be limited to what you can be objecting to. You know, you can raise an objection, uh, and these are limited to, to one a month, because what we found is you have activists that are going in there, and they're objecting to everything under the sun. And it's from all ends of the political spectrum. I mean, there's some people that really think all these books that have been in school are inappropriate. There's other people that know that they're appropriate, but are trying to act like Florida does not want these books in. So it's all part of an agenda. So this is really ferreting that out. I mean, I know Escambia had a lot of books that should not have been under review that somehow were. Um, you got to use some common sense on this. Uh, we had for many, many decades, uh, school was school. Then it seems like more recently it's all become uh, fodder for people to try to do the agenda. So we want to make sure that you have a right as a parent to send your kid to school, uh, and school's going to be school. They're going to be educated, not indoctrinated. And those are the tools that we've provided, but we're also going to provide protection about those being abused for people's political agenda. So I think it's going to make a big difference. Uh, I don't think uh, small school districts in, in, in particular should be inundated with a lot of these frivolous objections. Uh, people, you know, you know some of the books that are uh, objectionable when if you put it on the screen, it will not, the, the news will not put it on the newscast because it's too inappropriate to put over the airwaves. I mean, that's a pretty good test. If they're not willing to do that, then you know it's probably not something that should be in sixth grade. But at the other, on the other hand, you have so many things that have been part of, of education for so long, the idea that somehow Florida law is, is, is uh, trying to spark challenges to that is absurd, and this is really important that they corrected that. So I thank them for doing that. And if you are uh, trying to be an activist, if you're trying to withdraw valid materials as a way to basically lodge a protest, uh, you're going to be held accountable for that because you're depriving the students of their right to be able to, to have a good education. So that's the second component of the bill that, that is good. Uh, and the final one we'll highlight today, and we're going to highlight more when we get the bill and we sign it, but HB 1285 continues our commitment to military families here in the state of Florida. We pride ourselves as being a military-friendly state. We're the most military and veteran-friendly uh, in America. This region of the state in particular is very friendly uh, to veterans, uh, as well as the active duty component, because we have so many military families here. Uh, a couple years ago, actually three years ago now, uh, we signed HB uh, 429, which designated schools going above and beyond to support our military families as Purple Star campuses. Uh, the first year, over 120 schools met the criteria. Uh, now, two years later, that number has reached almost 200 schools, including 11 schools right here in Escambia counties. So we're, we're proud of that. Uh, what the legislature's put in this bill is to say that we are now going to recognize entire school districts as purple star school districts if they have 75 percent of schools in the district that are purple, purple star schools. So you're going to really see, I think, a handful of school districts lead the pack on this. Uh, this will incentivize districts to develop more Purple Star schools. Uh, this is a program that's open to all Floridians, public and private schools uh, participating in the scholarship program, charter schools, you name it. Uh, we hope to have more and more of these throughout the state of Florida because we understand that some of the things that these Purple Star campuses offer uh, is unique to uh, kids of military. And there are certain challenges that happen, especially when you have a career that takes you in different parts of the United States every two or three years. Although I do know once they're stationed here, they always keep the Florida driver's license 
license, and they always keep the Florida residency. They don't want to give that up, but nevertheless, you can bounce back and forth, and, that, and that's not easy to do. It's not ideal to do. So, so I thank the legislature for doing that. So I, I think if you look at and there's more that was in this that we'll talk about when we get the bill and sign it. We hope to sign it very soon. But this turnaround school program is really, really important because you, know, you can have success in, in many of your schools, uh, but if you have some of these schools that are languishing and they're F schools and no one's doing anything about it, you know, you're just telling uh, these kids that you don't care about them, and that's unacceptable. So we have good tools. This beefs up those tools. And here in Escambia County, we're going to hear about why this matters and what's been able to get done. So uh, we're going to hear from some of our folks uh, here. We have Commissioner Manny Diaz is going to be the first one to speak, and then we'll hear from some other folks. So, Manny. Thank you, Governor. And like you said, in Florida, we're, we're tasked with serving all students, not just some students, and we're committed to taking swift, positive action when our schools are in peril. And it's so great to be here uh, in Warrington, at Warrington today because the last time we were here, uh, I was here, and I was fortunate to be here with, with uh, Senator Doug Broxson, Representative Andrade, uh, Representative Salzman. And I want to thank you for continuing that sense of urgency through that process to make sure to get us where we are here today. And, and this experience has shown us that we needed to make some changes because at the end of the day, it is important that we have the ability to have this be a quick and a swift process. Because as the governor mentioned, a school languishes in, in turnaround and, and in a failing status, and, and that could be an adult problem. But at the end of the day, we have to focus on the students. And what happens to these students who are sitting for years in a failing school, not getting what they need? They do not get that time back. And so, again, I appreciate the cooperation. I look forward, Superintendent Leonard, to, to working with you. I know you took over after the process started, and, and we uh, are very happy with the partnership with Charter Schools USA here. And we look forward to this becoming an incredible school and incredible opportunity for all the students in Escambia. Today's legislation spells out the responsibilities of a school district when implementing the turnaround plan for a failing public school that closes and reopens as, as a charter school. Um, once a turnaround school is reopened as a charter school, the school district must continue to operate the school for the following school year, and a district must execute a charter school turnaround contract no later than October 1st. So school goes into turnaround. We, they choose this option, and they have to execute the contract October 1st of the year that they're still operating the school to assure that they have the partnership with the charter school that is coming in to have a runway to prepare to evaluate to see what the changes that need to be made, what personnel changes, what facility changes. I know a lot of facility changes have upkeep has done here in this in, at Warrington, and that's very important because we don't want the charter school taking over and starting with a very short runway. During this period, charter schools will have the opportunity to evaluate all of the programs and personnel and assigned uh, at the school in preparation for assuming full control July 1st. So the next July 1st after the October contract is signed. The district may not reduce or remove resources from the school at that, at that time. It's very important that we give the operator the opportunity with all the resources are there to make that evaluation to be able to see what programming and what personnel are kept. Uh, also, this uh, enshrines in statute what was done in the contract here, which is you had a, you had a school that, that was in the turnaround process, in the failure process, and you had students that didn't know where they were going to go. Like the governor mentioned, charter schools are open enrollment. This makes it so that we make sure that the students are in the service area, within the geographical service area, have first preference to m remain at the school once the charter takes over. Um, the, this ensures that there's a fair uh, and timely process that is efficient and students aren't parents aren't scrambling to figure out where they're going to put their child now it doesn't mean they don't have other options i know there are in, in this case there's other open enrollment options but if parents want to stay in their neighborhood school once the transition happens it's allowed in talking about the book challenges it, it protects the process for parents to object to inappropriate uh, books in their child's school let me be clear no pornographic materials belong in our schools that is what the governor has been saying all along, and we have continued to harp on that. 
There's this false narrative about banning books. No, what we're looking at is removing books that don't belong in a school. But as the governor said, uh, and thanks to his, this leadership, we, we've been able to make this change in this bill to make sure that we're not abusing the process. If you're a parent, by all means, you have all of those challenges at your disposal. And now the parents are thankfully paying attention to what's going on in our schools and what books are on the shelves. You have the ability to do those challenges. But unfortunately, we've had people that have taken advantage of the current law to overwhelm district with, districts with book challenges, knowing full well that there is nothing wrong with those books just to create a narrative um, to, to be able to say that Florida is banning books and, and quite often to attack our governor, I mean, and it's absurd. Uh, this brings us back to a process that allows parents and it even allows our taxpayers in the county where the schools are to have one challenge a month for up to 12. That will make the process easier for the district to get through because you can actually review the book in a timely manner and make sure that it gets back uh, on the shelves or it is moved. And sometimes during this process, books may be moved levels, right? We don't put a trigonometry book in an elementary school, right? We, we can move books that don't belong for smaller kids that may be more appropriate for middle school or high school, and that doesn't mean that we're banning a book. So again, uh, in Florida, we just continue to remain number one for school choice, for education overall, and, and thanks to this governor for parent rights. And Governor, I want to thank you again for your leadership on this. Sure. All right. All right, Dr. Eddie Ruiz from Charter School USA. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm very humbled and honored uh, to represent our board uh, and to represent Charter Schools USA uh, in this work that has been a, a, a you know, a love for me uh, because we've been able to see the work that we've been doing with our students. And first, thank you, Governor. Uh, thank you, Commissioner uh, and the State Board of Education for really uh, your commitment uh, to really not letting uh, – go of, uh, of the failing schools uh, that were out there, right, not giving up on students. And so we fought through that. Um, I wish we had the runway that we had, but we had about 60 days to turn around um, uh, here and, and do all the work that we did. But we knew from the beginning uh, that this was going to be a monumental task. This was going to be hard work, and there's no way that we could do it alone. Uh, we needed to come in together as a community uh, to do this. And so the Department of Education has been a part of that. Uh, Keith Leonard and the District of Escambia has been part of that. And anyone else, we opened up our arms and said, who can come and help us lift up Warrington Prep? And a lot of people stepped up to help. The bill the governor is uh, going to sign, hopefully here soon, around turnaround, will help future struggling schools uh, to be able to get more streamlined fashion. Um, we were the guinea pigs. We didn't get that right away. We've been getting help, uh, but this bill will really open up the red tape that uh, maybe is out there to get action down to where students need it and, and do what's right for students at the end of the day. Um, the district, they, they've stood hand in hand with us during the process. Uh, whatever you need, let's get it done because they realize we're in this together um, and it's about our kids here in the Scambia County. Um, so I appreciate that and thank you for doing what's right. And then other partners that really have stepped up and said, hey, I raised my hand, let's, uh, let's partner toge together. Um, and that's one NAS Pensacola. Um, they did a program with us for Starbase 2.0 here working with our students um, every two weeks, uh, working with our sixth grade students uh, on a STEM-based project. And so we're the only ones in the district that they're doing that with, and we are super excited to see that continue and progress towards the future. Um, we received a large grant for Triumph Gulf Coast um, to help workforce education, not only for our students around certification, but helping our parents and our community. So we're excited to go on that venture, and I know David Baer is here with the foundation, so I appreciate us believing in us here at Warrington and our board to do the work that we're going to do here over the next 10 years. Um, I have to say that there's, there's no work, the transformation that has been done here in the turnaround, um, if it wasn't for our, our teachers, our staff, and our leaders that have really have been here from day one, that saw the mission and said, hey, sign me up. I want to do what's right for students. It wasn't about pay. It wasn't about politics. It was about what can we do for the students here at Warrington. And they stepped up. And they've been here since. Um, and these they have been working their boots on the ground. And I, I couldn't just we couldn't do the work that we see here without those uh, teachers and staff and leaders. So I want to really thank them. Uh, we continue to provide uh, support and training for them, uh, building the trust. There's a lot of trust that has to happen in this community, and we've been doing that. And we've got a long uh, way to go. We're not there yet, uh, but we are definitely moving in the right direction. And lastly, I am so proud of the students here. There was a lot of change that happened when we came in, um, but the students have been resilient. When you lift the expectations and you put them high, students will rise to those expectations. And so 
They're see, we're seeing it through the growth of their progress monitoring. From progress one monitoring to two, we've seen the growth, and, we're, and hopefully, and we will see that uh, PM3 when the last test results come out, uh, the growth that our students will have shown because we're seeing them. They're moving in the right direction. And so um, I'm so excited about the things to come for uh, our next school year here at Warrington and continue to ask uh, the community members to step up. We've got to do this together. And again, thank you, Governor. Thank you, Commissioner, for allowing us to do the work here at Warrington. All right, Caleb Lovely, Dean of Students, Charter Schools USA. All right, good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Caleb Lovely. I want to take this time to just thank our governor. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you, Board of Education and our local government and the perspectives. I'm going to let you know that I've been here for 10 years. I was here when we were a public school with the Scambia County School District, and we will not negate the effort that Escambia County put forth for our school and our population. We pushed and we pushed, and unfortunately, we just weren't there. But I love the fact that we are now on a trajectory of growth and passion when it comes to making sure our students are prepared for not only success in their lives, but the future generations that's following. So again, I've been here for 10 years. I used to be the band director. I'm currently the dean. I've worked in different positions here at the school, and I call this my home. These are not these kids, these are my kids. This is not this community, this is my community. And here I am to represent not only this community, but the growth and the future that we have for our students and for our parents and for our community members. I want to make sure that we understand that CSUSA did this in under 60 days. The growth that was taking place in under 60 days is exponential. I have a saying that actions speak louder than words, and where words fail, CSUSA stepped up, and they stepped in into a, part, into a part that other people considered to be not worth it. CSUSA stands tall and states specifically that we will not give up on our relentless commitment to students' greatness in school and in life, and they show it every day. Our superintendent is here almost every other month. We have representatives coming to make sure that our teachers are supported, our student is supported. We have parent university who give out resources with our connections with um, our parent liaison. We are always committed to making sure our growth is there. We're going to make sure we see this hope in our students. Our students walk the halls with their heads high now. They say they have some place to go, and they have to get there quickly. And education is one of the biggest steps that they can take to, to achieve that and prove everybody else wrong. It is who we are. We get to tell our story. Everyone else kept telling us who we were. But now we have that opportunity and the platform to tell everybody who we are. We're going to show you in our data. We're going to show you in our efforts, in our culture. And I am so proud to be a part of that transition. Regardless of what everyone says, we're in this together. Here at Warrington, we have a saying that says, together we rise and we rise together. It is not us versus them. It is everyone here together making those steps necessary for the growth of our students and our community. Now, I will let you know that in those six, though, less than 60 days, there were so many heavy pushes. But the staff that stepped in and stepped up, their shoulders are broad. And I'm a big man, too. <laughs> and I can carry a lot. But the load gets lighter when we have the people in the right places who care, who put forth the passion, the purpose passion that is backed by integrity that digs into what is called the grit that is necessary for our school to be not only our school but our community to be that platform that people can look up to when it comes to education not only education but the change that is necessary for the educational process and I'm just so thankful to be a part of that here I am a dean in title but these are my kids this is my community and I love the fact that our teachers get to do that. They get to do what they came to do as an educator. They're not just teaching a subject, they're teaching a whole child. They have a platform and a process and a program that is going to not only build them integrity and internal, but give them those steps and those platforms for our students to spread their wings and be able to reach beyond measure. As a person who's been in every type of system that said that I couldn't, I prove every system wrong. 
and that is why I'm here for our students. And every teacher who wants to be that type of impactful person, come join us. Be a part of the growth of greatness when it comes to making sure our students and our population can say, regardless of where I come from, I can get to where I want to be and even reach further than that. Some of our students didn't know they had the capability to be great until somebody spoke into them. And so I, I beg and I plead that anyone who wants to be a part of that greatness, be a part of the growth, be a part of the greatness, join the Warrington team. It is not easy. My shoulders are broad. I'm a big man, I know. I'm on the diet, don't worry. But the more people we have to support, the easier the lift will be. So come be a part of the growth. Watch us grow. Watch us change what it means to be successful. So if you would take this time, repeat after me. Together we rise. Together we rise. And we rise together. We rise together. Now say it like you mean it. Together we rise. Together we rise. And we rise together. We rise together. And so as we speak into our students and as we speak into our community, be a part of the change that is necessary for growth. It is not easy, and we're making those incremental steps, but I promise you it will be worth it because every single student matters. And be a part of it. Don't talk about it. Be about it. Thank you. Okay, Representative Jennifer Kennedy. Does anybody else feel like we've been in church? Yeah. Have we gone to church? It is such a privilege for me to be here with Governor DeSantis, with Commissioner Manny Diaz. I want to acknowledge the great work of my partners in the legislature on this bill, Senator Danny Burgess. It was my privilege to carry this bill in the House. When I'm not in the legislature, I am a middle school teacher. I direct the RISE Institute at Lakeland Christian School. And I cannot tell you what it means to somebody who has spent decades in the classroom to be able to travel around the state and know that we have people who are as passionately committed to children um, all across this state. And not just those of us in the legislature, in the House, and the Senate that care about this, the governor who is passionately committed. Um, there are educators, there are school administrators, there are people all around our state who care more about what is good for children than, it is, than what is easy for grown-ups. And when we all are focused on children, then we see extraordinary things happen. So I want to talk just for a second, in addition to um, what the governor has talked about and what the others have already talked about, I want to tell you just a couple of things that this bill does. HB 1285 prevents students with a disability from being placed in a dropout prevention program or an academic prevention, um, ac academic intervention program solely because of a disability. This bill is going to require that we treat students as the individuals that they are and make sure that they are in the best learning environment for them. And for those students that are placed in those academic intervention and dropout program, it's going to require that they have individualized learning goals, that we are focused on what they need to do in order to be successful and we are passionately committed to their success. This bill also allows for specialized transfer degrees so that students who are in our state college system that want careers in STEM fields are going to be able to continue to get the scholarship dollars that they need in order to make those dreams come true because it is about what is good for students because what is good for students is what is good for our state and when we see all of our kids rise, our state rises with them, and that is what we are about. So thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Governor. Such a privilege to carry this bill. Thanks. Okay, Sarah. So I guess i got to follow all of, all of these wonderful people here. <laughs> um, I'm honored to be included today when I was um, contacted to come up here. I have three children ranging in age from college bound to entry level elementary school. Um, we also are, are a former foster family as well. Um, I embrace the opportunity to advocate for all of our children in all of our schools. 
Safety in our schools should be a priority, our first priority. If our children are not, they, if they don't feel safe, they're not going to learn. Um, all children should have a safe place at school, and I believe every one of us have a responsibility to do that. Whether it be legislators, whether it be teachers, whether it be administration, whether it be parents, or whether it be other students as well. When someone or something threatens our, that safety, whether it be mentally, physically, or emotionally, parents should have a right to bring that unsafe person, place, or thing to light. We should be able to ask for action. I expect the public school system to educate my child, not parent my child. I've said that over and over again. It's my job to bring those, those hard issues and talk about those hard issues in my home. It's the school system's job to educate my child, teach them to read and write and do math. I expect the public school system, or I, I excuse me, I expect the library to be a safe place safe place for all of our children. Sexually explicit material should not be able to make its way into our school libraries under any circumstances. Material that threatens our children ultimately makes them unsafe, especially younger tender age children. I don't want my second grader to be able to walk into a public or a school library and access materials that are sexually explicit under any circumstances. I'm very thankful to a governor that is willing to listen, and I'm especially thankful for a governor that is willing to take action. Schools need to be a place to learn to read, write, and do math, not a place to be parented. That is my job. People that are using this action to further agenda have absolutely zero place in my child's school. School is not a place for agendas. People with agendas have taken what this was meant to be an avenue for parents like me to advocate for the safety of their children and made it into something that has created chaos for our teachers and our administrators, and I recognize that. That is not what this was intended to do. It is intended to keep our children safe from the sensitive issues that need to be taught at home, not at school. Every parent should have the right to raise their child in a safe manner, whatever that may look like. That's the beauty of living in freedom. By allowing sensitive reading materials in our public school library, that freedom is essentially being taken away from me. Materials that introduce sexually explicit and inappropriate material to my elementary age child is absolutely inappropriate and absolutely unacceptable. There are no circumstances where this would be appropriate. As for inclusion, just teach your child to be kind, always. That was one of the biggest arguments that was brought to my attention with the book band was, well, how are we going to teach children about these sensitive issues? Well, you don't need to teach them about sensitive issues because you don't have to know what a person is or how they live to be kind. Just teach your child to be kind to everybody. Just demonstrate kindness in your home. Teach them kindness in their ways, and you should never, we should never have a problem. I don't need to know anything about someone to just be kind. Um, my oldest child um, is, is actually, we are successfully to the, to the school choice, and I want to thank you personally for that because my oldest child, um, two weeks ago, well, last year he was able to ch transfer into a, um, a, a school that helped him actually be able to move on and further his dreams. He signed um, a, a scholarship to attend a four-year private university um, to play baseball and to go on and further his academic needs, and we never, we never would have been able to do that without that. So I thank you so much. I thank you for just being willing to listen and being willing to act on that. Well, I really appreciate everybody coming out. Look, um, we, uh, we have a turnaround school program because we aren't going to just uh, accept failure and throw up our hands and say there's nothing that we can do about it. We believe that, that every kid in this state uh, has potential. I don't care if you're rich. I don't care if you're poor. I don't care if you're black. I don't care if you're white. You can succeed uh, in this state if you work hard and you have a good environment and be able to do that. So it's our responsibility to ensure that if a, that if a school's failing, that, that we have prompt action taken to be able to put it on a better path. Uh, that's what's happened here in Escambia County with this legislation. That's going to happen more frequently 
all across the state of Florida. So uh, I'm proud of the legislature for doing this. I know we're expecting to get this bill soon. Uh, there's other provisions. I think the representative uh, highlighted some others. It's a pretty comprehensive piece of legislation. We'll talk about those when we sign the bill, which will probably be very soon. Uh, but for today here uh, at this turnaround school, uh, we want to make sure that, that all of our schools are able to do well. And we're going to make sure that we have policy in place to get that done. So, so thanks, everyone, who's been a part of it. And I uh, look forward to uh, signing this into law very, very soon. Okay, do we have any questions? Yes, sir. I think, I think each individual situation is uh, based on what's going on in the school. I don't think there's one answer for every single example of a school that may not be doing well. There are times where you can have remediation within a district that can be successful. There are other times when, when that's clearly not working that you've got to try something else. So, so I think it depends on the facts and circumstances. But ultimately, our role in the state is to, to set the policy we have Manny, who now is able to have even more tools to ensure that these decisions are made promptly. But, you know, ultimately, uh, the citizens of Escambia County elect people to sit on these boards. And, and they're the ones that are ultimately accountable uh, for whether they're going to do, do right or not. And so, so it's a team effort. Uh, we want to work with any school district and school board that, that wants to in, improve education. Uh, we think we've seen a lot of great stuff throughout the state of Florida. Uh, not every school district in this state and or school board has, um, has necessarily wanted to see positive reforms, but I will say in the 22 elections, some of the ones that were dragging their feet were shown the door by the voters, and so that's just the way the cookie crumbles. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So this bill will do that. So basically, if you don't have a kid in the school district, you can challenge one book per month. And I think that will help short circuit these frivolous challenges. Because it's being done to create a narrative that somehow, oh my gosh, all these books are, are quote, banned. No book is banned in Florida. The most grotesque pornographic books that are in schools that, that, are, that have been removed because they're not appropriate you can go buy it at a bookstore. If that's, if that's what floats your boat, you're able to do that. <laughs> but do not jam that down the throats of a sixth grade child. That's wrong. And it's wrong because parents don't want it. So let parents uh, make those decisions and be able uh, to do. But the frivolous book challenges need to stop. What's gone on in this county has not been something that, that the law has, um, uh, has tried to, to, to do. In fact, just the opposite. Uh, so we want to make sure that hopefully these the, – the, and, you know, look, in spite of the media, uh, some of the narratives that get put out there, most school districts like many have almost no removals or very little challenges for this. Most school – a lot of the school districts aren't even messing with, with some of the nonsense that's being done. There are some that are doing there's, there's one in particular that's got some really bad stuff the parents are fighting, and I know they're, the state's looking at what it can do. Uh, but my, my ideal would be that none of this, uh, that no parent would have to go in and, and, and register an objection. You know, when I was growing up, we didn't have books that were a problem. No one said anything. It was like you did normal school. Now, all of a sudden, it's like uh, you're, you're trying to pursue, pursue an agenda. So, so we're not going to do that. But just as it's wrong for uh, a school district, an activist, teacher, uh, a school union to try to impose an agenda on the students, it's also wrong for citizen activists or, or parents uh, to, to do these passive-aggressive false challenges to try to act like somehow – you know, we're, we're not, we don't want education for it. So, so this bill does correct that. Now, we, there was thought about, in the, I know the legislature said, but should we just say if you don't have a kid in school, you shouldn't be able to do anything? And I think ultimately what they did was right because, yeah, you may not have kids in school, but if you're a resident and a taxpayer, you have a right to be concerned about what's going on in the schools. Uh, I think that's an important part of the community. So, so to say that they can't be involved at all was probably too far, but – Clearly, this has been abused. 
clearly people are trying to pursue an agenda, and we're saying that is not uh, consistent with the state laws or state policies uh, governing these matters. I mean, the number of challenges should be very rare, uh, and if you look at some of the most problematic books, that is a very, very small number of the total amount uh, of books that are, that are being done. And so it's, a, so it's a small thing, but I think it's indicative of what's the purpose of education? Is the purpose of education to impose an agenda on the students? Not what I believe, not what our founding fathers believed. Uh, I think the purpose of education um, is to provide students with the tools to be able to acquire knowledge and think for themselves. And that's really what we're striving for here in the state of Florida. I don't think it necessarily would by, by the text, but I think that the, the issue is, is the fact that the legislature has weighed in like this should be uh, evidence that how that was done was not consistent with the uh, spirit of the law. And so let's stop playing games with all this. Let's make sure that we get to education, not indoctrination, and, and really focus on that. And if we do that, uh, I think everybody is going to be happy. And you know what? If you as a parent have an interest in educating your kids on some of the things that most of the other parents find inappropriate, you do have that right to do. Uh, it's not something that the government's going to come over and, and, and oversee. But the idea that a parent sending their kid to school should have to worry about some of the garbage that we've seen out there uh, put into their school system, no, you shouldn't have to worry about that as a parent. You should rest assured send your kid to, to first grade, uh, they are not going to be told that they were born in the wrong body. They are, that's, that's in Florida, that is not going to happen. So, so let's, just, let's just agree to that, and let's agree to have high standards and, and promote good education. All right, thanks, everybody. God bless. <laughs>